Afrique Média. Le monde, c'est... Afrique Média. Le monde, c'est nous. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Views on the Continent. African diaspora on a topic of discussion. As the diaspora of developing countries, uh, the diaspora of the developing countries that was for long ignored by their continent is today a potent force for development for their countries of origin through remittances and importantly through the promotion of trade, investments, research, innovation, knowledge and technology transfers. The perception of who and what is an African is already changing. The African Union's current definition of what is considered the diaspora consists of people of African origin within and without uh, Africa who are willing to contribute to the development of uh, the continent and building of the African Union. With the prevalence of technology today, the African diaspora now has many different channels to help transform their countries within the continent. Thus, some school of thoughts think that for such development to take place, it is capital that the government puts in place mechanisms and regulatory bodies so as to better channel the efforts and contributions of the diaspora. Also, improving the business environment and making available the right information via social media will allow people within the diaspora to not only have access to people within the continent, but also have access to information pertaining to what is happening within their various countries. The African diaspora, though gradually being involved in the development of their countries of origin, still face challenges due to some government policies. What do the various African governments need to do in order to involve the diaspora fully? What are the various circumstances or things that hinder the diaspora's involvement in the development of their various countries of origin? A topic of discussion in today's edition of Views on the Continent. Stay with us. Afrique Média. Le monde, c'est nous. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. A pleasure to know you are tuned to your Pan African television this afternoon. African diaspora and their role in the development of their various countries of origin. Our topic of discussion on this edition of Views on the Continent, you want our interactive program. Wanting to know what the African diaspora uh, has to do or how the African diaspora contributes in the development of their countries, we know very much that for some, for quite some time, they have been involving or trying to involve. However, there are certain, certain mechanisms that hinder their full involvement involvement in the development uh, of uh, the African uh, economies. On today's edition of Views on the Continent Interactive Program, we have on our platform an economist uh, who is going to enlighten us so much on how these uh, diaspora can involve in the development of their countries and how everything uh, the government and the diaspora can work, work hand in hand for the promotion, the development and success of their various countries of origin. It is uh, good for uh, the brains to move out of the country for more greener pastures, for more development. But what is best? Is it for them to stay out of the countries or come back to invest? We discuss this on today's edition of Views on the Continent. In uh, today's edition, we have in our studio Ms. Uh, Dr. Ambe Valentine. You are a political and an economic consultant. Welcome. Thank you, Rita. Good afternoon, viewers of uh, Afric Media, viewers across the globe. We are very excited to be here today to talk about the African diaspora, how they can help benefit their countries of origin. It's been a subject of uh, debate over several medias across the nations. And that we are going to be contributing our own quarter, what we think they should and what they are not doing, actually. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you very much. Uh, we equally have via video link uh, uh, Mr. Elijah Inuaku. You are a researcher with the Lix University uh, in charge of development. Thank you, sir, for joining us on today's edition of Youth on the Continent. Thanks for having me, Rich. I hope we can have a fruitful discussion about this topic that has been animating a lot of uh, media all over Africa, not just Cameroon or French Africa, but it's been a discussion. And uh, even here in the diaspora, uh, there's been a lot of discussions and forums about it. Um, hopefully, we can have a one hour fruitful discussion of what the potentials are, what they can bring to the table, and what they are not doing, and why they are not doing what they're not So, thanks for having me. Very important what the diaspora can bring to the table and uh, what they are not doing in order to do that and what prevents them those are all the problematics we are going to tackle as i'd like to stay with you uh mr elijah Enwako, researcher with leaks university in charge of african development so what is your own observation uh, about the role of the african diaspora in the development of uh, uh, their own various countries it's colossal if at all it is being harnessed the right way. Because as we start this discussion, I think the preamble for some of this discussion should be the African uh, Union Charter and the mm -hmm. preamble about uh, who an African diaspora is. Yes. If you read that document and you read that charter, it's, uh, they have a funny definition, I'll call it. They call it uh, die an African diaspora. Mm -hmm. is an African who lives out of the country mm -hmm. and who has the intention and the willingness to invest back into the country or to come back to the country. Mm -hmm. So it, it puts a political twist to the definition of who uh, a diaspora is. But in terms of what they contribute to the African economy, it's colossal. If you read the United Nations Development uh, Index document about the impact of diaspora, African diaspora, currently every year, the African diaspora contributes close to $46 billion to the African economy. That's huge. We are talking about individual contributions. That's huge. And then you talk about the potential of the African diaspora out of Africa. That's a different thing altogether because we know the richest man in the world is in Africa. Elon Musk is in Africa. Many people might not understand that or not know that, but he's in Africa. So in terms of what they can bring to the table, it's colossal, it's enormous. You already mentioned a couple of them. It's technology, research, innovation, uh, ICT, whatever it is that you mentioned, the African diaspora is doing well in Africa. So some of the discussion that we're going to be having is, why is they not bringing this back home? Are there some bottlenecks along the way? And or what are they what they are currently doing? Is it enough, or is can they do more? But in terms of the African diaspora, um, I would say first and foremost, if you do not value what you have, you won't make use of it. Because if you see even within the economy. Um, those who do not understand what they have go looking for something else, thinking that there's something better out there, better than what they have. So the first thing is, does the African government, the powers that be, understand the value of the African diaspora? Do they intend to harness it? That is a question. Because if you look around African countries, it will shock you that there are only 17 countries in Africa that give dual nationality what i what what do i mean by that giving the opportunity for their citizens that have obtained nationality in another country to, to still be nationals of their country of birth it is only 17. why is that important it is very very crucial to understand this it is not because people just want to you know have the nationality of the country where they live and live there it is because they want a means of you know if i live here and i want to get a nationality of this country i want to maintain my uh, Cameroonian nationality because so that I can you know, transact business back home without going to look for a hassle of a visa to travel back home, back and back. And not only that, there is a lot of things when it comes to you know, investment and all whatnot. You want to be on top of things. So that alone tells you that the African government and powers that be, even though they put a political stint to who a diaspora is, do not realize or understand the potential of an African diaspora. So that's something that we're going to be discussing along as we go. 
we are talking about the African diaspora, just like Mr. Elijah earlier mentioned. A couple of people would be mistaking exactly who an African diaspora is. In your own opinion, who is a diaspora? Well, uh, from the word diaspora, it speaks mm -hmm. about away, being away. Mm -hmm. People who have left their country of origin to go look for greener pastures mm -hmm. somewhere, a, a more better definition would be immigrants. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, considering the situation of what the African continent looks like right now, there's so much we're expecting from those who have gone to, in quotes, mm -hmm. the developed world to gather knowledge, to gather experience, to also interact and understand the systems of government that operate there, to come back home and then better the African society. And that's what we are expecting from the African diaspora. But as much as we have uh, a lot of hindrances that will not allow them manifest, they also equally have some deficiencies we have to address here. Mm -hmm. We must balance the coin on both sides. So beginning with the uh, hindrances, we, Mr. Elijah just mentioned dual nationality. A lot of African countries deny dual nationality, which is also a very, very strong point raised there that hinders them from coming back home to invest. Mm -hmm. Mm, uh, I did a study on Europeans and Asians that travel out. What they go out, when they come back home, they come back with CDs and DVDs in their hands. That is, they've gone to study the technology, they've mm -hmm. gone to study the science, they've gone to study the system of operations there. They can put all those things in a DVD drive, in a hard drive, and come yeah. back home. Africans come back home with used mattresses, overused vehicles, abandoned fridges and fans to come and make this continent become a dumping ground that we say in economics it's a dumping ground that is the used or fairly used materials in europe become a dumping ground in africa and that area i think is a very serious problem that's the first thing we have to lay as emphasis africans do not go to bring the technology from outside into this country they go to carry the waste products from outside of the country into this country that's why there is a new market now called brocant mm -hmm. that's a market that did not exist until our brothers began traveling and you go there you will see used diapers used shoes to the extent we're having bras used diapers yes. Dr. bras pants t-shirts i wonder how we could condescend this load to the extent where a wife will put on a bra then my wife wears it after her a white, white woman will put on a pant, our wives wear it later on. Uh, it's so disappointing and so disheartening to see that our own brothers go over there to bring trash into this continent. Secondly, most of our African brothers who go to study abroad, when they study there, they are given assignments to do their thesis and research. Mm -hmm. They come back to Africa. When they come to Africa, they do their thesis, for instance, electro... Uh, uh, um, petrochemical engineers they may come here and then do their research around cameroon kenya ghana uganda what they would do is that they would take those reports that they have done mm -hmm. compile back and go and submit it as your thesis in the universities there the professors will now read knowing fully well that cameroon in somewhere around bikoko there is gas there they will not get in touch with the ambassadors in cameroon to go and carry humanitarian works around that vicinity and deceive the mayor or the local authorities that we are coming to help children do this. Then they will ask that particular piece of land to be used for something. Mm -hmm. And once they give them that piece of land, they begin to exploit what our research from our students here pointed back to them there. So our students who are studying abroad, supposed to go there, draw knowledge and come and invest here, they go there, draw knowledge to come and reveal mm -hmm. what we have here to those who are over there. And that's the reason why there's a lot of exploitation of resources in this present age not in the colonial era because our poor are blind with what is happening what i'm telling you is confided in me by a cambodian researcher who studied out of the country in denmark mm -hmm. um the issue of not permitting diaspora to invest here is bad governance okay. i know of persons who have come to this country they want to invest millions mm -hmm. but at every single table you cross you have to drop an envelope and sometimes the amount of money you bring before you will get the document or the license that will permit you to operate, bribe must have collected it. So they have these two deficiencies. They have government authorities that will not allow them to invest here because of bribery and corruption. And they have the deficiency of 
the dual nationality that will not permit them to invest in their own country. Okay. I think those two things are major hindrances to diaspora investment. But on the other hand, they also are playing a lot by going to carry fairly used materials in Europe and America to come make Africa a market. Okay, so if I got you clearly, you would say, though it has some advantages, uh, 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 African citizens immigrating yes. out of their countries mm -hmm. is bad because they go and study and they come and review the secrets they are research. of their... Yes, yeah. their research reviews where their natural resources are placed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Mr. Elijah, can you uh, uh, enlighten us? What do you think? When uh, Dr. Ambi talks about uh, furthering studies abroad, immigrating for further studies, is good, but more of bad because their thesis review the the, the, the the secrets of their countries of hidden uh, treasures within the country. What's your impression about that, Mr. Elijah? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. I want to clarify something. Uh, mm -hmm. First on base, my friend. So, but I want to be very clear. Mm -hmm. When it comes to research, when you do your research, whether you do a research on ge what is the geological research or project development, project management, whatever it is, a deposit to the country that be, mm -hmm. uh, whoever gave you that information is give, what gave you reports information. When it comes to the to the uh, exploitation of resources of the country, the mayor. It is not within the auspices of the mayor to grant a license right to a company to exploit the resources of the country. That is the government of the Republic of Cameroon mm. that gives rights, block rights to any com company to exploit the resources. No company will come to Cameroon and go to Manfe and begin to drill wells without coming through the Ministry of Mines and Power to, ex to, to, to get a license to extract. Mm -hmm. So. I want to make that clear that it is not because a thesis is being submitted here and then somebody takes the thesis and then discover that there was something in Cameroon. The geological evaluation of Cameroon has been mapped out. It's well known. If you go on the internet, you're going to see, you know where oil is or whatever it is. That is not where the problem is. Now, I want to come and give a um, second point that you mentioned. He's right in saying that some people come abroad and brought back all matrices, all whatever, all whatever, that's a legitimate point. But who is to blame? The government of a country that allows foreign goods to be dumped into their own country to compete with locally produced goods is a government that does not know the fiscal policy that they have. Because you are not supposed to allow foreign goods that are competing with your local goods because you're going to kill that industry. So it's a problem of bad governance at the same time. Now, I want to go now to you know, those who bring innovation, because we shouldn't paint diaspora as people who only bring old bra or whatever, whatever. There are people that bring technology, people that bring innovation to this country that have been hampered. There is a case of a colleague of mine. He graduated from the University of Berlin in Germany. He's a Cameroonian. He came to Cameroonian and started, I can't remember the, the, the field that he started, but it's an electrical engineer. He started a company in Cameroon. I am telling you, how long it took him to get a license, the kickback that Dr. Apostol uh, mentioned, <coughs> the issues of the bottlenecks and even getting people to set that up, he failed. This same colleague left and went to Botswana. Within a space of one year, he was already making a profit. Huge company. That's to give you a difference between two countries that value the potential of their uh, diasporans. One that does not value, and the other one that values. I'll give you another example. He mentioned the Indians, for example, the Asians. That is a legitimate case. But what happened when these countries, you take the Philippines, for example, that's a case study that it's all over the internet, all over, you can even Google it, you see it. If you take the Philippines, what their government did is this. These people have gone abroad. There are a lot of international students, researchers all over. The government defined and designed a quota system and said, in every area, we're going to cap out a quota and said, this is for our researchers, our diasporans to come back home and invest in this. When it comes to projects and things like that, 
they are going to, you know, within the administration, I mean, uh, the government set out a quarter of project and said, these projects are going to be handled by our diasporans. And they invested into it. The people came back home and the potential was huge. All the bottlenecks were uh, completely eliminated. Take India, for example. That's another case study. He talked about chips that when they started over here, when they're going back to the country, they're going back with chief American debt. India, as we know today, when it comes to IT and technology, there are a lot of Africans that are even going to India today to study. But where did he start? A lot of Indians that started here in Canada, here in the United States and Europe and so on, went back home and the government, and I emphasize the government, the government opened up a department of diaspora to monitor all the projects that they came back and they were instituting, and they invested in a way that secondary school students were being groomed to invest, I mean, uh, to go into those areas. It was manufacturing, it was IT, it was vocational studies, and all. But what do we see in Africa? Every day is about Enam. The next day is ENS. The next day is this. The next day is this. The next day is this. There is no policy that is going to encourage and it's encouraging diaspora to come back and invest in what they have studied. That is the problem in a lot of African countries. And not only that, when, we, when I mention about dual nationality, it is also a political problem. Recently in Nigeria, there was a debate in Nigeria about allowing the diaspora to vote in the upcoming election. A popular member of government stood up and said, diasporans are not Nigerians. When you have people with that kind of mentality, that immediately you leave the country, you are no more a citizen of that country, that tells you that they do not value those diasporans. Why? These are politicians that are afraid, for some reason, that people that are outside are going to influence the politics of the country, and therefore they want to hang over, hang on to power, and do not want their people. These are people that are looking after their own interests, and not the interests of the nation. Because if they are looking into the interests of the nation, they are not going to call Nigerians that are abroad that they are no more Nigerians simply because they are abroad. So they are afraid of them. So these are some of the things that we are talking about. As long as the country does not have a policy of opening up for the diasporans and encouraging them, because as I said before, diasporans have not stopped doing what they are doing. $46.5 billion every year in the African economy comes through remittance from diaspora. So these people are still consciously, in one way or the other, investing into the economies that we have. But having an open door policy where they are being welcomed and encouraged and saying, please, we want you back home to bring whatever you have, technology, innovation, research, in every area. We want you to come and invest this thing back. Those policies are still lacking in Africa. And I can go on and on and on and on. But what I'm trying to emphasize here is that if the African economy is going to benefit hugely from the diaspora expertise, they have to craft out policies that are going to encourage it. Recently, recently, I just want to mention this, but I give, give you back the back. Elon Musk was asked, you have Tesla, you have this, you have this, you have SpaceX, you have Tesla, you have problems. Why are you not investing in South Africa? You know what he said? He said, he tried, but the amount of import tariffs that are placed on those electric cars for them to enter South Africa, he said it can be completely non-competitive. That is a South African-born billionaire. The richest person in the world is not able to invest in his own country of origin because the tariffs, because first and foremost, he's going to build the, the, the company in South Africa. But before he does that, he has to import some models in Africa and do a test prototype and see how they do and how they do well in South Africa. But for him to do that, the amount of tariff that he's been taxed for those cars to be transported in South Africa, it was prohibitively unproductive. Therefore, he didn't do it. So I'm just giving you this so that the African government know that they are an impediment to the diaspora investing in their own country. Thank you, Mr. Elijah. Yeah, uh, get to know more. When exactly did the diaspora receive this wake up call to, or when did the continent rather receive this wake up call to start involving the diaspora in developmental issues of the continent? And 
Should the diaspora, a diasporan return back home to invest in the country or could their investment contributions be done even from back, from uh, out of the country? Um, I think the wake of the this 21st century, we started mm -hmm. calling the attention of her because at first, most people who traveled abroad hardly came back. Most yeah. of them who traveled went and settled there. But the truth is, lately, Europe and America is becoming too congested and mm -hmm. a bit too difficult for people to invest there. And from every ramification, you discover that most of the countries over there also are running towards Africa. Mm -hmm. Africa, according to statistics, is going to be the major hub of economic development in the next few years or years to come. And that's the reason why you see China trooping here. Russia is coming back. You mm -hmm. see people are rushing to Africa because Africa is the hub of economic development. And so Africans who have lived in the diaspora for some time now begin to understand that they have more privileges even than those who are coming from other countries. Because first and foremost, they are citizens of the countries in Africa. Secondly, they have their roots in Africa. Thirdly, they have the opportunity to access natural resources and probably lands to, de to, to do development projects, developmental projects in Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, because of that, I think that awareness is now pushing almost every African with a diaspora to come back and invest here. Secondly, the amount of money they may have there may not be good enough to invest there. But when change in Africa, it's huge sum of money. Mm -hmm. You can take ten thousand dollars, you will do more here than do something in America. Mm -hmm. If you come with a hundred thousand dollars in Africa, you will do more than you can do with it in America. Yeah. So the ratio of the currency also influences they are coming back to Africa. Now, when you, you should uh, should they come back and invest here or they should remain there? No, every African should come back home because home is home. The truth is, if you see what is happening, is a kind of what happened at first? The Europeans came here, mm -hmm. collected resources, both material and human, to okay. go and develop. Mm -hmm. So we are going there now to go and collect technology. And bring back home. And bring back home. Mm -hmm. It's an exchange. And that's the reason why I said they have exploited us a lot. Now it's time for us to exploit. Mm -hmm. Like you, in the past, Africa was a mission field. Yes, but now the mission fees now are the one receiving missionaries from Africa. <laughs> you have pastors going abroad everywhere to plant churches there. So there is a change right now. So Africans should go back to Europe. What caused Europe to come here? Europe came here because they had industrial revolution. And they did not have enough materials to use with their machines developed there. Mm -hmm. So they came to Africa. Africa now has discovered that it has a lot of raw materials. They, what they lack is the machines. They should go back there and collect the machines. Mm -hmm. Because they came here because they lack cocoa, they lack timber, raw they material. lack coffee, mm -hmm. they lack rubber, they lack tea. They came here to collect it because they had discovered machines. We have found out we have timber, we have cocoa, we have rubber. <laughs> so we should, should go, go back, back and get the machines and, get and the bring machines back home. And come back here. And that's the reason why I get worried when somebody travels to Europe and comes back here with what we can process here. Mm -hmm. The rubber, they are going to, they are going, the matrices they are collecting from there, the rubber Thank came from here. here. We need better machine, that processor we will not be paying uh, custom duties and taxes to go over there again to buy those things and bring here. What makes it even worse is that they are fairly used before, brought, bring, mm -hmm. before being brought here. Mm -hmm. um, I like my friend, Mr. Elijah, he speaks very well. And uh, he's my friend. <laughs> I'm sure you are surprised. He's a very good friend of mine. Uh, when he speaks in Africa, he will speak as a churchman, which I am also. When things are normal, we follow the <laughs> geological demography. We follow the protocols of the Minister of Mines. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but let me remind him, a very quick reminder, that Africa is not what you think. I know you've lived a lot in Europe and America, probably Canada, and things are very transparent there. Not in Africa. A lot of things are leaving this continent every day out of the country without the knowledge of certain authorities. And as a matter of fact, a few authorities may know how some things leave this country. Do you know there are companies in this country that have the right to transport, export, and import things without any verification from custom officers? Mm -hmm. They have such authority. So when you talk about you talk about things like that from a general point of view, you talk from an ordinary point of view, mm -hmm. we are talking as men who live on ground. Uh, and as, as a businessman, of course, you, <laughs> yes. you encounter most of them. Oh, most way. of them. Mm -hmm. That's the issue. So when I hear him talk, I understand that he's talking from that very saintly mentality that he brought from Canada. But not <laughs> here in Africa. We understand this very well. So Africa should come back home. Why? Because uh, to me, I believe that the time has come for us to go back and collect the technology. An African should not go to Europe to go and look for 
or fridges or cars or what no africa should go there to see how we can get the technology there and bring back here and mind you another thing they say the excuse that is the government is the government those people is that's what are building houses here Mm -hmm. They are building houses here. How do they build those houses? They could build those because they have families here who have nationality. I don't have dual nationality. Mm -hmm. They could use their families to extend their businesses in Africa. Why not register the business in your father's name or your mother's name or your cousin's name or your sister's name and invest through them? That is a challenge we have. If they keep giving excuses that when they come here, they refuse and do a nationality, do a nationality, do a nationality, your sister or your brother can establish a business and invite you over as an expert. Mm. You come there. That's a wisdom. And I've also said that if I'm given the opportunity to run the affairs of this country, I may cause a major businessman in this country put money in their hand to be tarring the roads. Since the colonial masters doesn't want the president to tar roads, put it, let it be as a work of philanthropy. Okay. That is what the problem is. So if they keep giving us excuses, that no, no, the government, the government, the government, which I know very well, we have a very complicated government. As far as I'm not aware, most African countries have this difficulty penetrating to invest in their country. But the truth is, wisdom is profitable to direct. Mm -hmm. I'm sure those people who live abroad, Elijah sitting there, probably has dual nationality. But he has father, he has brothers, he has sisters here, that he can come back and give the money to open the company in their name establish it as it is there is a story of three brothers in south america precisely cuba these guys had a brother who was a cripple on a wheelchair he gave birth to a vision of a sugarcane plantation when he birthed that vision he didn't have the strength to go when he birthed the vision the brothers who could work very well took the vision engaged it and they become a richer families in south america that is because somebody used the brain Another person used the hands. Mm -hmm. And that is how families work. The strength of the Jews is that Jews work as families. There is no individual. The kingdom has killed African businesses and African enterprises. That we have a one man enterprise. We don't have people who work as families, as communities. And that's the reason why if you see a Jew come here or a German, I was sometime in Cape Town, South Africa. You see Jews, when a Jew enters there, they will ask you, tell us the area of your specialty. You don't need to be related to him. Mm -hmm. They will gather money as Jews and invest in you. You pick up after two, three years to gather the money and give back to them. They are waiting for the next Jew that will come. The same with the Germans. It's a community mentality. Until we get out of this sole proprietorship, independentist mentality, this one-man show in Africa, we can never develop. Okay. I think when we left this Africa, we left families. We left cousins, we left friends, we left brothers and sisters. You can't tell me that there is no trustworthy person <laughs> in your entire generation. You, you mentioned a trustworthy person and it's something that I wanted to ask. Uh, now, uh, Mr. Elijah being a diasporan, Mr. Elijah being a diasporan, uh, we, we, uh, <laughs> we cannot have him to talk right now. You're talking about trust. Uh, from uh, the the the, uh, the the diasporans, if they don't have any family, many have been betrayed. I'm many seeing so are, being aware. Are, are depending, are trying to, are not uh, uh, investing because they want to do a sole proprietorship. Mm -hmm. But I think that it's uh, we cannot really talk of trust in in in, uh, in the greater sense or in the greater aspect because we know we are Africans. Mm -hmm. it, it, there are many who think of family, but there are also many who it's the same family who helps to kill. The, 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 the ideology, the vision of one person's dream. So how now uh, we I come now to ask this other question. How uh, do you uh, see its uh, investment or productivity of a diaspora more efficient only in dual nationality? Because we have some countries which permit dual nationality while mm -hmm. others don't. And in the same, uh, in these same countries where dual nationality is uh, banned, we have their government officials who have dual nationalities. Of so how do you see that? That's the reason why I told Mr. Elijah that mm -hmm. when you speak from that saintly point of view, everything being equal, mm -hmm. paribus, mm -hmm. you can understand, but not in the content of the Africa. Mm -hmm. This Africa we are talking about, there are individuals who will kill you for having dual nationality, mm -hmm. yet they are having dual nationality. Because the system of government in the continent is not balanced. We have government officials, ministers who have dual nationality. We also learned of the case of the Fika food president of Cameroon, who was accused of having dual nationality, dual nationality and not yet being he able won to elections. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yet he won elections 
to hurt the thicker food. Mm -hmm. Now, there is some small poor young boy somewhere in Europe and America who got that nationality because they wanted stability to gather income and come back to Africa. Mm -hmm. Why would they hinder such an individual from coming back to invest here? That is where the challenge is. Okay, let me hear from you, Mr. Elijah. Uh, sending now the same question back to you. Should diasporans depend solely on a sole proprietorship in order to be able to invest in their countries of origin and uh, uh, how is uh, the 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 if, what is the effect of uh, non uh, the, the non dual nationality on you people the diaspora how does it affect you if you're not given a dual nationality to be able to invest okay. I want to put things in perspective because mm -hmm. sometimes when we talk, it's, it sounds so abstract. And, you know, sometimes when you put things in perspective, it makes sense. Yeah. Most of you know the professor of ICT, my good friend, Professor Victor Mbarka. He's running a university in Cameroon. If he tells you the bottleneck that he goes through in order to come to Cameroon and supervise that university, his father or his uncle is not going to supervise that university. What knowledge in ICT do they have? What knowledge in ICT do they have? He, we're talking about technical stuff here. not talking about somebody building a, a house behind your backyard and then you give him money to buy. No, of course, we do have families and they do those things for us. We are talking about institutional companies, strategic companies, innovation, technology, ICT, or whatnot. The things that we have studied here, bringing them back home. Your family is not going to run uh, a manufacturing company for you. No. Let's be specific on what we are talking about. You are talking about building a house, of course. I can give money to a uh, person to build me a house without me coming to Cameroon. I don't need to be in Cameroon for him to build me a house. Mm -hmm. He can do that. But I'm not going to give him money to start <laughs> a, 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 a manufacturing company. That's not his expertise. I don't expect him. That's not his expertise. So let's be strategic with what we are talking about. We are talking about the knowledge, the ideas. You guys talked about bringing chips from here. When you bring a chip, do you give it to your family to go and put it on a computer and start doing what you, you learned here? No. You have to be there to make sure that you implement what you learn. Apart from that, there's another aspect that we are missing here. When it comes to um, strategic planning, we are also talking about partners. Because as a diaspora, as I'm here, by the grace of God, I'm exposing Africa to other companies and other people in this part of the world and showing them the potential that we have. These are people that we're going to come along with. So what do they do? Before they start any company, invest any huge amount of money, they're going to do what we call a project modeling. You're going to model your risk. What are the risks of investing my money? Nobody's going to take $100 million, come and invest with his eyes closed. They are going to evaluate what is the potential of this thing actually making a profit. People are out to make a profit. You're not just out to invest because, oh, I was born here, therefore let me invest here. No, you want to make a profit out of what you're doing. So in that sense, people are going to evaluate all these things. That's why I keep saying it is true that the diaspora has a part to play. And when it comes to the diaspora, I do not think anybody, who comes from his country who say, oh, I just want to enjoy this life here. Like a person, book, and they already mentioned, if I invest $10,000 here in Canada, what I will invest in is peanuts. If I take the same $10,000 and invest in Cameroon, we have the human capital, human resource. We have people to work, cheap labor, or whatnot. That money is going to yield me much more income much more revenue than the ten thousand dollar invest here. So they put they 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 they, they draw the draw for me to invest back home is there and people want to do it because it makes economic sense. So saying that diaspora don't don't want to invest back home, that is a moot point. It doesn't it doesn't really make any sense because anybody that does an economic evaluation will understand that. Investing back home will yield more than investing here. So let's start looking at why not with all these ben benefits and why not that they're doing it. My friend, a Dr. Tata Ulri started a business in Cameroon that is transport trans uh, transforming cassava, potatoes, or whatnot into powder, all this. Good and fine. 
But how is it going to run that business if it does not have the electricity power? Every day, today, electricity is cut off. The next day, there's no electricity. The next day, how is he going to trans get his goods, the bananas, the yam, on from the market, I mean, from the farm to the market? Or is it going to depend on those market women to go carry it on their head, come and sell to him? That's not a company. You're talking about large-scale production. You're not talking about producing two uh, packs of uh, flour and selling. Large-scale production means the potential needs to be there. The partnership needs to be there. The resources need to be there. The, 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 the political will that we already talked about has to be there to encourage people into all this. You asked me a question, how does dual nationality you know, hinder or not hinder? I already answered that directly. I said, if it's going to take me one month, two months, three months to process a visa to come back home, and I'm going to be given two, three weeks or three months, and then I have to go to Yaoundé and renew, and sometimes it can even be rejected. can be rejected. You are not guaranteed to get a visa, even as a national of that country. You're not guaranteed to get it. If you have dual nationality, for those that have it, you're not guaranteed. And if those bottlenecks, if it already becomes uh, a deterrent, then you don't expect somebody to invest in that kind of place where he is going to be having difficulty even traveling there to observe those business. I gave you an example already that a Cameroonian, an engineer, started something in Cameroon. It did not take long. It failed. He left, took the same business and went to Botswana. It was not up to a year. He was already having a profit. And the company has grown tremendously because the Botswana government welcomed immigrants. I mean, a diaspora, people, the economy is open to investment and they attract those investors. So the government in Africa, if they want diaspora, should be able to encourage these people. In many ways, we are not enemies. These people are not politicians that are coming to topple the government because that's the fear most of the time. They allow them coming, they're going to come in with, you know, the, the Western democracy and begin to topple this. That's not, that's a moot point that many people are tying on this. So, Again, the diaspora has so much potential, and they've been doing what they can do, but we are talking about large-scale industrial production, not building houses. Building houses, real estate is one of them, but we're not talking about coming, giving money to the family member to build a house for me. That we can do any day, any time. There are equally cases of um, uh, diasporans who are, are not welcomed, by local experts in the country because these uh, local experts think that uh, the diasporans receive some uh, special privileges, unlike they who are nationals and who are in the country. So uh, how can the government handle this particular situation? Sorry, receive special privileges from who? From the government? Are you talking about diaspora receiving special pri privileges from the government? I don't see that happening <laughs> everywhere. Can you hear me? So I, I was I was talking about uh, some local experts who think that so in in some countries some uh, diasporans receive uh, better incentives and uh, uh, privileges which attracts them which uh, attracts them in the country and we, and they are sometimes having uh, uh, blockages because they are having these attractions and these incentives better than they who are local uh, nationals who want to invest in their same countries is that true and how best can the government handle this i do not see this happening in any african let me not generalize i don't see mm. this happening in most african countries number one if i have technology research knowledge that do not currently exist in my country of origin, and I want to bring it back home. It is but normal for the government that be to encourage that person. We're not talking about local industry that exists. Mm -hmm. You're not going to tell, you know, the government should not be encouraging somebody learning how to make cassava from abroad, and then say, come and make cassava in Africa. Do we already know how to make cassava. Mm -hmm. That's not what we are talking about. We are talking about expertise that do not currently exist, or that are rudimentary, that needs to be developed, that people have learned here, technology, research, innovation, in every area mm. that does not currently exist back home, 
to be encouraged. Those people need incentives. There's no, no doubt about that. Okay. You're not competing with the local industry. You are actually revamping and encouraging and making it better, whatever there is. You're not competing with them. So that kind of mentality saying that government is uh, prioritizing those in the diaspora to the detriment of those who are back home doesn't make any sense because they, they are not competitors. Mm -hmm. You are, in, I mean, you are, uh, how do I put it? it you work hand in hand to boost one another. The local knowledge is still very welcome. If I start an industry back home, I'm going to need, let's say I start a manufacturing company, I'm going to need mechanics, local electricians. I'm going to need, need me right. I'm going to need these local people. And that's another sector we have not talked about. Mm -hmm. The government is not encouraging vocational education. It is lacking in Africa because if I want to start for a, a company in my area, I would need all these people I just mentioned. But are they being trained? Are they there to enhance the company or maybe to be recruited to work in the company that diaspora one? I have another friend in Germany. He's an aer uh, aer uh, aeronautical engineer. It's true that we don't have aeronautics happening back home, but it can be expanded in different areas, electromechanics, and so on and so forth. Yeah, are these industries there? Let's even look at the case of Rwanda. That's a case study. Kagami, I call them an ingenious. Even though when it comes to politics or whatnot, I don't even bother so much about politics. But <laughs> what he is doing in Rwanda is an example for a lot of African studies. We have in Africa education that doesn't benefit anything. You have people with degree in this degree, in that degree, in this degree, in that, loitering the streets, doing nothing. They can't use that degree to benefit themselves. So the government should be able to expand the economy and see what the economy needs. Do we need more degrees in English, in French, in geography, or whatnot? Or do we need mechanics, electricians, electromechanics, and uh, me rights, this one, this one, agriculture, all these things. These are the areas that government is supposed to you know, dwell on, enhance those areas so that even partners, even though we have been talking about a diaspora a lot, but diasporas will also come with international partners because we are not talking about investing $10,000. $10,000 is not going to do much. We are talking about millions, people that are going to invest their money in order to get a return. International partners will be there. But when these international partners look at the economy and say, do I have the people that are going to be recruited to work in these industries? If the answer is no, they're going to shy away. Ghana is an example. As we speak today, companies all over the world are going to Ghana to recruit me rights, electricians, mechanics, or whatnot, from Ghana to the Western world. Because the Ghanaian economy is starting in the time of general. He opened the, up the economy and said, we know these people from outside need this kind of tools. They need this kind of trade. They need this kind of people with this kind of handwork. So the Ghanaian economy came up, open to those people, and they focus on vocational education. Those are things that encourage not just diaspora, they encourage international partners to come into the economy in Africa and invest. Thank you very much, Mr. Elijah. Dr. Ambe? Well, we hear yeah, most of the time, some people say that uh, the diaspora is called upon to come and invest, but they are being very hesitant to respond to the multi-calls by uh, uh, the, 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 the government. Now we've equally heard from a diaspora, Mr. Elijah, that there are certain conditions within the country that do not permit them to come back home or to feel free to come and invest. And he mentioned among those uh, challenges, some government policies. We know that this uh, go uh, governance is another policy which is a, a great challenge that disregards the efforts of uh, most diaspora. So what do you think needs to be done in that aspect? Yeah, we've spoken repeatedly about government granting the diaspora dual nationality because uh, if at all they do not have nationalities over there, they will not have a stable home, a stable business, or stable mm -hmm. source of income. Mm -hmm. They definitely need nationality here also to invest back home. It's like extracting from one source and then investing in another source. Mm -hmm. That is one of the things we think they have to. Uh, secondly, the government should make sure they exploit the knowledge that the poor diaspora brings back home here. 
I think uh, those who study abroad have something in their minds mm -hmm. which they have learned so far in terms of administration, technology, science, even medicine, that if opportunity is given to them, mm -hmm. they are going to make things better in the country. But you know, it's absolutely impossible for a diaspora to actually exploit their potentials in the country of Africa because the presidents or the authorities do not give them the opportunity to exploit what they have. Mm -hmm. Like I was saying earlier, Mr. Elijah said that uh, we are not talking about investing $10,000, $5,000. The problem we have here is trust. People who don't trust themselves hardly trust others. <laughs> the aspirants don't trust themselves, so they don't trust people. We're talking about opening a company, opening a business in Africa. It is an administrative job. Mm -hmm. It doesn't demand expertise. You may take your expertise and come and invest it in the company when it is established. But the problem is who has that legal status to stand in front for the company to be given the full right that a company can operate within the conference of this country. I have a company and my company is in offshore and onshore. I'm not a marine engineer, but I was given that registration authority authorization to operate that company. I now bring marine engineers left and right that they want to go offshore, onshore, they would some blasting, pipe filtering, uh, welding and the rest. That is because I'm a Cameroonian, my name is in the document, and as a Cameroonian I have the right to open a company because it's my right as it, and the privileges. I'm not going to be asked my profession. I'm not going to be asked my qualification. I'm not going to be asked if I have a skill in that area. Mine is to set up a company. And I bring now the poor and gifted and skillful in that area. So when we say we can use family members or trusted friends or colleagues, is to get the authorization. You, as the expert, you come back and work in that company as an important expert. Just we have experts here from China, experts here from different countries. I have seen companies in this country bring experts from Philippines to come and weld that ship, petroleum pipes here in this country. So if you are coming under the banner of that company which is established in your brother or your sister's name you are the one that have the technical know-how of the company mm -hmm. we are talking about the administrative authorization to operate that company in the country here i'm giving as a suggestion as a wisdom to operate in um you know there are some things that we cannot actually explain them on air because it won't sound normal when we want to say things on television we say things that appear normal in the ordinary eyes of humans but there are things that are not normal in this country. There are countries, though there are companies in this country, multinationals, that are in this country. They bring things in this country and export things out of the country, and nobody takes them. That is the level of the rights and privileges that are given to them. But yet there are Cameroonians who cannot come into this country without being investigated. It's the same problem that uh, Mr. Elijah is posing. That's what I'm trying to let you understand. Mm -hmm. So it is very important for us to understand that when there is no when, when, when a particular door is closed, we should start thinking out of the box. To just sit and fold our arms and say that government has not given us dual nationality, government has not done this, government has not done that, government has not done that, is to me a sign of laziness. Because anybody who thinks very well will look for a means to come out of a challenge. So if the government does not give dual nationality for the next 200 years in this country, does that mean the diaspora will be lost in, in oblivion? That is what the problem is. Okay. Now, how do or how 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 come Jews and Germans go to other countries and invest? How come they even succeed in other countries when they are not even, I repeat, even citizens of that country? Do they have dual nationality? They don't. The problem is they use their mind and they are able to trust individuals. You cannot tell me that everybody on earth is a demon, or is a witch, or is a wizard, or is a four one nine, or is a scammer. No. We should start thinking out of the body because if the government holds on that the next 30 to 40 years they won't give dual nationality are you telling me that the diasporans will remain there and frustrate forever no i have a friend in england he has plantations in this country and he has sent machines as i'm talking to you we had a chat yesterday he's sending machines for quarry and other things but they are coming under the name of his mother but he's a british now he will come to Cameroon as his visitor, yet he is the one that will know the technical know-how on how to run that company. And he's going to be moving very, very well, not because he is the one that registered the company, but because he is the one that is the brain behind the company. Just like you go to a movie, you will never see the director. 
-hmm. It's behind the camera. There's one that makes things happen. You must not be at the forefront of an association or a company to make the impact. That is the truth. Okay, I am the head of Cameroon Pentecostal Association. I give vision to people executing it. As a standard, we are organizing an agro seminar in Tico, mm -hmm. 21st and 22nd of this month. This is not just to train farmers. We are training farmers also sponsor projects and create platforms for people to also process their materials. You don't see me at the forefront. There are persons who are working it. So sometimes when we are talking about using wisdom is because we are caught in between the anvil and the hammer. We are caught in between the devil and the deep blue sea. You must devise a means to come out of the, to the trauma you find yourself. Okay. Investing one hundred million dollars or two hundred million dollars, what is what 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 is what is that? What is special about it? If your name is not there, what is special? You okay. want to tell me that everybody on earth is fake? It's trust. We don't have trust. Okay. Thank you very much. Now, Mr. Elijah, having uh, had a couple of uh, uh, reasons that uh, uh, that are a hindrance to the aspirants' involvement or complete involvement in the development of uh, uh, their various countries, now I would like to know from you how best can these diasporans contour these challenges in order to make their presence and their, their, their presence and their know-how felt within the continent? Yeah, I'm going to shock some of you <laughs> who are listening to me. The diasporans are not quiet. If you reject, if Cameroon does not accept me, I go to Botswana. That's the Africa. If Nigeria does not accept Professor Babatunde, He's going to go to Rwanda. And I encourage all diasporans to do this. Countries that don't accept you, don't fold your hands. Go to the next country. Let that other country go to hell. We don't care. Because if I am from a country, I grew up in that country, I went to school in that country, I studied in that country, and for you to reject me after that just because I've come abroad tells me that you don't need merit me. That's the fact. So my encouragement to all diaspora is that don't cast your net only on your country of origin. Cast your net all over Africa. Diaspora is diaspora. Wherever you can invest, a lot of us are doing it already. Let me just into here. Wherever you can invest your resources all over Africa, Africa is Africa. We are Pan-Africans. Look for where it is being welcome, hospitable, invest in Africa. Those are still Africans. That is my message for all diaspora. Don't fold your arms here. Use all the technology. I mean, gain all the knowledge that you need. Gain everything you need. Get all the knowledge. Go open your eyes. Mm -hmm. Ghana is opening up. Botswana is opening up. Zimbabwe is opening up. South Africa is opening up. They're changing a lot of their laws. A lot of countries opening up. French Africa is still tight, with the exception of Mali that's opening up now that they've driven away the French. Open up your opening, I mean, your, uh, your, your possibilities. Don't sit tight and complain about your home country not welcoming you because Africa is Africa. Invest everywhere. That's my message for all diaspora to okay. navigate this kind of situation. Okay. At the same time, we have some analysts who said, uh, uh, who uh, propose that forming a legal professional entity of diasporans is another uh, 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 tactic through which these diasporans can really make their voices heard. Do you agree? Legal entities to fight for their rights within their countries of origin? Yeah, they are proposal. So do you think well, it's, a, it's a way out? Do you think it's an important proposal? Do you think the solution is worth it? Let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. More than 10 years, the Liberian Association outside formed a legal entity to mm -hmm. fight for dual nationality because they wanted to go and invest in their country. As we speak, it is just with the coming of uh, George Weir that that bill has been taken up again. Nigerians have done the same thing. You, you are not going to fight the sitting government with legal entities and win. Because first of all, you are not being, you are not being recognized as a citizen of that country. That's what's happening in Nigeria right now. They do not want Nigerians out of the country to vote because of what's happening. They are so afraid. So mm -hmm. there was a law that was tabled within the Nigerian assembly that Nigerians out of the country supposed to vote. It was voted down. Okay. 
So thank you very much, Mr. Elijah. Let me have a concluding statement from you, Dr. Ambe Valentine. So uh, we, we, it's, it's very important, like Mr. Elijah said, it's really pathetic for a diaspora not to have uh, the, 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 the free will, the freedom, the permission to be able to invest in his country of origin. It's true, investing back into, the, uh, into Africa is for the African continent. Of course. It benefits the African continent. But if a Cameroonian cannot invest back in his own country, and rather has to go invest maybe in Nigeria or in Gabon because his own country did not welcome him, that's no good sign. How do you think we can make turn this thing around to really better it? Um, to me, I believe um, governments come and governments go. Mm -hmm. No government lasts forever. Mm -hmm. It's rather unfortunate the governments we have now are the ones who are against dual nationality. We have to keep pressing it. Cameroonians and other countries that do not have this privilege have to keep pressing and agitating until the bill is signed in the parliament. For instance, Etofis, I was told, came to establish a football school in Cameroon and uh, the conditions they gave him were not favorable and he went to Gabon. I've been to Gabon, I've seen the football school established in Gabon and um, a lot of Africans are also establishing businesses. There is this airline they call to my airways. Mm. To my airway is in charge because the conditions were not favorable. But I'm like, people own it. We're not favorable in Cameroon. So you ask why is it that the people who belong to a country are denied the privileges from investing in their own country? There is more to that. Because I don't think our government or the authorities that be actually hate progress to deny their own children who have gone out, brought greener pastures back to their country to be denied the privilege. There is something beyond what is going that meets the eye you earlier mentioned you earlier mentioned uh, uh, poor governance and within it we have uh, bribery and corruption yes. we've heard of many of these investors coming and say they are not able to meet the right person because those who are at the bottom do not permit them to reach at the top to meet who is due for them to have this permission and you find they find themselves having to bribe and bribe and bribe all along yes some rita. who are not comfortable with that of course would have to turn back yes rita the issue is first and foremost what what is hindering them from granting their own people dual nationality mm. is that bribery is that corruption? away 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 from the or away from uh granting uh, dual nationality they don't have access to see the official in question there is a whole lot of protocol yes that's what i said here earlier mm -hmm. i i am sure i mentioned that earlier here that most of the people who are in authority are not even accessible mm -hmm. you are going to pass several barriers and spend much money before you even meet these individuals in question and it is so disappointing that sometimes you meet them and you don't even achieve what you intend to achieve what is so painful is that multinationals come to this country and they are very, very at ease. Mm -hmm. Yes, you have multinationals from France, from England. We have a uh, petroleum company like Friedlander, uh, Perenco and the rest, Bolloré. New Age, Bolloré and the rest. They are at ease in this country. There are countries, there are companies from China exploiting go around uh, Yokaduma area there. They are at ease. Now our own people who have gone outside and made money, they come back to this country it's a bit difficult for them to even access the authorities that be. And the excuse they are standing on is that is dual nationality. While there are so many ministers in this country with dual nationality. So, there are other top-notch officers with dual nationality. Is that dual nationality <laughs> selected on a group of persons or is a national law? Is it a tribal law, a judicial law, a legislative law, a law of status? Because the law does not apply to almost every Cameroonian. Okay. It applies to people who do not have the capacity or the, the stamina to confront the state or they don't, they don't belong to the high and the mighty. So with that, we are going to say that there is more to it that meets uh, That's the what eye. I'm telling you. It's rather unfortunate uh, that there are so many challenges which uh, diasporans have to face. And of course, you cannot force somebody to come and uh, to somebody cannot force himself to buy from you if you are not receptive. So uh, with this program, we're trying to see how to encourage African governments to be able to 
give open doors and opportunities to the fellow diasporans, their citizens who've immigrated, to be able to come back. And we're looking at the various ways that can be done and also what these diasporans have been doing so far in order to contribute in the development of uh, their countries. And uh, dear televiewers, this is where we call it off for today's edition of Youth on the Continent. We had on our panel Dr. Ambe Valentine, a political and uh, economic uh, consultant. Thank you so very much for being with us. We equally had Mr. Elijah Nwaku, uh, a diasporan on the platform this afternoon, and he is equally a researcher with Leeds University on Africa and development it was a pleasure to have you sir so we call it off now at this point in time tomorrow is another edition of views on the continent but for now keep trusting you upon african television for more programs are right ahead bye bye <laughs>